Good evening. I'm Claire Saxton, Senior Director of Education with the Cancer Support Community. Welcome to our webinar, Frankly Speaking About Cancer, Living Well with Metastatic Breast Cancer. If you need technical assistance during the webinar, please dial 1-866-229-3239, option number three. Before we get started, I'll go over some reminders and housekeeping items. If you would like to listen to today's presentation via telephone, please dial in using the conference line code you see on the screen. Today's call is being recorded and will be available on our website at www.cancersupportcommunity.org slash webinars within the next few days. The format of today's webinar will be as follows. The panelists will present first, and then we will open the discussion up to the audience during the question and answer session. Thank you to those who submitted questions prior to the webinar as part of the registration form. If you would like to ask additional questions, please feel free to type those into the Q&A box on the right of your screen. You may submit a question at any time during the event. At the end of this webinar, you will be automatically redirected to a survey after the webinar. Please take a few minutes to complete this survey as your input is of great value to us. I would now like to introduce the Cancer Support Community, which is the largest professionally-led nonprofit network of cancer support worldwide. CSC is dedicated to ensuring that all people impacted by cancer are empowered by knowledge, strengthened by action, and sustained by community. The Cancer Support Community is a global nonprofit network of 175 locations, including Cancer Support Communities and Gilda's Club Centers, healthcare partnerships, and satellite locations that deliver more than $50 million in free support services to patients and families. In addition, CSC has a toll-free helpline and produces award-winning educational resources that reach more than one million people each year. Formed in 2009 by the merger of the Wellness Community and Gilda's Club, CSC also conducts cutting-edge research on the emotional, psychological, and financial journey of cancer patients. In addition, CSC advocates at all levels of government for policies to help individuals whose lives have been disrupted by cancer. In January 2018, CSC welcomed Denver-based nonprofit My Lifeline, a digital community that includes more than 40,000 patients, caregivers, and their supporters that will enable CSC to scale its digital services in an innovative, groundbreaking way. On this screen, you'll see some of the resources we provide at the Cancer Support Community. The first one there is the Cancer Support Helpline, which is staffed by licensed professional counselors who are available to assist you Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern Time. We also have our Open to Options program, which is a research-proven program that can help you prepare a list of questions to share with your doctor. Finally, we have our Frankly Speaking About Cancer program, which is CSC's landmark education series. It provides trusted information on a variety of topics important to people affected by cancer. Information is available through print and digital publications, online, and in-person programs. For the complete list of publications, please visit orders.cancersupportcommunity.org. I would also like to introduce our Cancer Experience Registry, which is a unique project for people affected by cancer. People who have been diagnosed with cancer and those who help care for them can join the registry. You begin by answering survey questions. Your answers and those of others describe the experience of cancer patients and caregivers. This information is used to provide education and support resources that speak to patients, caregivers, and their needs. For more information or to join, visit www.cancerexperienceregistry.org. I would also like to take a moment to talk about our grassroots movement, which helps ensure that people touched by cancer have access to quality, comprehensive cancer care that includes social and emotional support. This community will provide you the opportunity to get up-to-date information on key issues that are important to patients with cancer and their loved ones. It will allow you to be part of a network that interacts with Capitol Hill and other policymakers on important issues to cancer patients, and it will allow you to have your voice heard alongside other voices of patients with cancer and their loved ones. 
Again, if you'd like to learn more about this program or to sign up, visit our main website at www.cancersupportcommunity.org slash join hyphen our hyphen movement. I would now like to introduce our panelists, Dr. Lydia Shapiro and Nancy Lomibau. Dr. Lydia Shapira is Associate Professor of Medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine and Director of Cancer Survivorship at the Stanford Comprehensive Cancer Institute. Dr. Shapira specializes in the care of women with breast cancer and of all cancer survivors. Her clinical research is dedicated to improving quality of life and health outcomes for people living with cancer and their caregivers. Through mentoring, teaching, and writing, Dr. Shapira has contributed to training oncologists to recognize the importance of tending to the social and emotional dimensions of care. And Nancy Lomibau has been licensed as a marriage and family therapist, LMFT, since 2000. Nancy has worked at Cancer Support Community Redondo Beach in California since 2014 and is their program director and chief clinical director. She oversees the programs that support cancer patients and their loved ones. This includes group and individual counseling, mind-body classes, and workshops. Nancy has lived in the South Bay of California her entire life. So tonight's webinar will include making treatment decisions, living with uncertainty, and the triad of nutrition, exercise, and sleep. So I will now ask Dr. Shapira to start us off with making treatment decisions. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be with all of you today. And uh, we're going to start by talking about something that's really important. Um, it, living with metastatic breast cancer presents so many challenges that feeling really that uh, feeling good about your treatment team is a very important component of coming to terms with it and living as well as you possibly can. So some of the advice I can give you as you approach this is to try to learn about your doctor's training and specialty. People have multiple specialties. There are those who specialize in primary care and others who specialize in medical specialties. And the treatment of cancer patients is called oncology, and people must take a specialized training, usually at least three years, in order to be certified to provide cancer care and prescribe chemotherapy and cancer-specific treatments. Some are certified also in blood diseases and that those are called hematology, and many oncologists have trained in both. In fact, the training programs are combined. Some are trained in surgical oncology and some are trained in radiation therapy. So it's important to know the background of the doctor and other clinicians on the team to know what their area of specialty really is. And then you want to know more about whether or not that oncologist has particular interest, expertise in the type of cancer you have. In this case, it's breast cancer. There are some oncologists who provide care to patients with all cancers. So the number of breast cancer patients and patients with metastatic breast cancer they see may not be nearly as large, and therefore they may not have the experience or um, the uh, authority really in the field. And that's important to know if the situation requires, you know, some advanced kind of thinking and even considering treatments that are not really standard. So asking the doctor what training they've had and whether or not they see all patients with cancer, only patients with breast cancer, they give you an idea of what they're about. Some oncologists also carry out and participate in clinical research. And those doctors sometimes really um, have their um, have a very good understanding also of novel therapies that may at some point be of value to you as well. You want to know not only what their training is, but also how they practice. Uh, do they work in what we call multidisciplinary teams, meaning that they work side by side with radiation oncologists, surgical oncologists, and those who specialize perhaps in mental health, 
uh, rehabilitation medicine, and perhaps other important areas. In other words, are they talking with and working together with people who have different areas of expertise and all of this can be brought to bear to make, you know, a customized treatment plan for each patient? And then the other important part is, you know, where are they practicing? A community oncologist may be a wonderful doctor, but if you're really looking for a center where there is an active program in clinical trials, you may be better off at a designated comprehensive cancer center as a special and National Cancer Institute designation to show that these centers really are robust members and contributors to uh, cancer care and the advancement of cancer treatment. Next slide, please. So now that you have some idea about how you're choosing your treatment team, the next question you can ask yourself is, how do we talk? How do we communicate? How can I best um, reach my doctors? How can I reach the nurses? Who do I talk to about what? So it's important to know your communication style. Are you the kind of person who um, is very clear about what you want to know? Are you the kind of person who wants a lot of information or perhaps just a real recommendation? And then the other important piece is, you know, how are you going to reach the clinicians on the team if you have a question or a symptom that needs attention after hours? So it's important to know you know, who's available on the team? Is there a social worker or a navigator or a nurse who can help mediate that communication? Is there a patient portal that you can use to push out your question? And then what do you expect in return? Will that be answered within hours or days or will you have to wait a week? Asking these questions and at least having them ready, I think is also important to help you feel confident. Um, and to know basically um, what you would do if you have an after-hours emergency. Next slide, please. It's also important to understand your diagnosis. There are many types of metastatic breast cancer, so it's important to know the type and the stage of cancer, perhaps at the time of diagnosis. And then it's also important to know at the time of metastatic disease what what studies have been done to try to characterize the tumor? Have there been receptor studies? Have there been genomic uh, profiling studies to try to figure out what the drivers of growth of that cancer are? Could that information be then put to use to match you with the right type of treatment? If you are not somebody who is very well versed in science, perhaps you need pictures. There are pictures, ask for them. There are websites, for instance, that have appropriate pictures. And then the important thing about this is also to make sure that somebody is with you, if possible, in person. Although I've been in situations where we have used technology very creatively to um, allow the phone uh, to bring somebody into the room who can't be physically present because they're perhaps thousands of miles away, but really the most important caregiver um, and, and supporter of the patient. There are many websites that have expert vetted information, and it's important to ask for a recommendation. Not all the websites have completely credible information, so it's important to use real uh, discernment when you um, look for information that may impact how you view your disease, how you view your options, and what you want to talk about in terms of treatment with your oncologist. Next slide, please. And then once you are informed and once you have done a little bit of, of research in some cases, some cases that's not necessary, depends on what the level of information you need to feel satisfied and, and confident, then it's time to start talking about treatment options. And one of the important things about living with metastatic breast cancer is that there usually are some decisions that need to be made. And while the oncologist can be an expert in presenting these treatments to you, you are finally the expert in knowing what you need to achieve what you define as the best possible quality of life. Uh, there certainly are many 
uh, patients living with metastatic breast cancer who really are enthusiasts of clinical trials and want to be on as many clinical trials as possible. And I know there are others for whom perhaps um, maintaining a more low-key approach so that they continue to have a very normal life and minimize the number of times they need to see the specialist may rise to the top of the list. So it's important to know yourself and how much you're prepared to invest in treatment and also to ask your doctor to talk to you about the kinds of treatments that, that, you, that are available to you and ask also what the goal is. And what, by that, uh, uh, what I mean is ask, you know, is this going to give me good quality of life? Is this the best treatment that's going to extend and prolong my life? These are the important questions to know. And also to ask, you know, what can I expect? And your doctor should be able to answer that question based on their uh, knowledge of the disease and also their experience. But talk to others on the team as well. Talk to the nurses. They often know uh, very well what day-to-day -day problems um, are that arise for patients on those particular treatments. And they have an, a really valuable perspective. And also talk to other people who've had cancer, but please remember that they may be authorities in their own experience, but that is just what it is. It's their experience, and it may or may not be applicable to you. Next slide, please. So the questions that should guide your conversation in the clinic or in the doctor's office are really these. What is the goal of the treatment you're recommending? Um, what can I expect? Without, are we thinking that the cancer may um, may respond completely? Is it go, am I going to have what, what is called a partial response, meaning it's, we're going to stabilize it, or it, we're only going to see uh, some areas of cancer decrease? How long will it take before we see results? How long will those results last? What can we expect? What is the standard treatment? What is the treatment that has been given to, to many women before in my situation? And why are you recommending this treatment for me? Help me understand that. What can I expect in terms of the risks of this treatment? You know, what, can, what are the common toxicity? Will I lose my hair? Will I lose my taste? Will I be able to work? Whatever is important to you. And then, Go to the positive. What are the benefits? What have you seen in terms of the results of these treatments? You know, can I expect my symptoms to go away and to improve? Will I live better and longer? And how will we know if the treatment is working? This is something that really needs to be discussed. And, and, and often, you know, the answer is, you know, we'll do scans or we'll do blood tests or you will know because this cough you're having or this particular symptom, this pain, will get better. And then, of course, the big question is, how will the treatment be given? Is it a pill? Is it an injection? Is it every day? Will there be breaks? And for how long? The answer to the question for how long usually is something like, as long as it works and as long as you tolerate it. Next slide, please. More questions here to guide the conversation have to do with the option of being on a clinical trial. And this is very important when we're talking about metastatic breast cancer because there are so many novel treatments available on trials that sort of having a map or, or uh, you know, an idea of how many trials are, are available or to you and then what sequence you may want to use them in because sometimes, you know, they're very specific criteria for joining a, tri a trial, and if you've had too many treatments, you may not be able to join, or one trial should be done before another. So joining a clinical trial should be something that's discussed early and, and also reviewed often. And if you do join a trial, then think about also um, how, it, how your side effects will be managed, where you will receive it, and then whether you're in a trial or getting standard treatment, of course, keeping that communication line is really, is really uh, important. And feel that you and your clinical team can also recover if there is a little problem or can find a way of discussing um, openly uh, if things aren't working for you. For instance, if you say, you know, I really felt 
anxious about the results of my scan. Nobody talked with me or called me or returned my call for five days. Is there a way that we can make this better? But it's very important to bring these items to the attention of the teams, and most teams are pretty responsive if you tell them exactly what you need. And finally, how do I obtain a copy of my record? There are many patients who want to keep a record, who want to have the copies of their tumor marker results, for instance, and so you should also be open and ask about that. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to turn it over to Nancy to talk about how you make your treatment decisions. Thank you. So the first four bullet points here on making your treatment decisions is really about finding out a little bit more what are the things that might influence your treatment decisions and what can help support you. So meeting with a financial or insurance counselor there at the cancer centers, one of the important things so that you can better understand what are the costs that are involved and to make some kind of plan for payment. You might be at a very large hospital system or a smaller local oncology practice or somewhere in between. So finding someone that can help you understand those uh, questions and those costs is important. Also asking to take a tour. I think sometimes part of wrapping your mind around something is being able to see it, to walk through it, to have your questions answered. And a lot of times there'll be some type of learning center or a library, some sort of resource room. And usually volunteers or librarians are there to help answer questions, help you access different resources. So make sure to ask for that as well. And I think making sure you understand that things are going to change. And so where your mind might be set on something, there can be many factors that influence your treatment and your treatment decisions to change. Of course, staying focused on what's right in front of you, the present, rather than trying to jump ahead or make decisions uh, all at once. That's important. Next slide. So your cancer journey has many decision points along the way. And of course, taking things one step at a time is very important. You don't want to jump ahead and, and try to figure everything else out. It's just about what do you need to find out about right now. So when you're locating yourself in the process, it's really about being compassionate, kind of centering yourself, figuring out what your goals are, what you want to do, what your direction is, and you want to educate yourself about your cancer. Uh, also, you want to be productive in your treatment team. So trying to meet as many people possible on your um, treatment team, that is key, and being able to bring someone with you to the appointments. It's a lot of information. It, is, it can be at times overwhelming. Sometimes you might get caught up on something someone says and miss the next five sentences that follow. So bringing someone with you can, who can also hear the information and then being able to debrief afterwards at the end and, and talk to that, that hopefully someone special that you brought with you who understands you and has taken either good notes or help you to understand what was said. Also be selective about the information, about where you're seeking it. A lot of times the first instinct is to go online and Google it. And that's not always the smartest thing to do because there's a lot of scary things out there. And a lot of times people who are writing in on bulletin boards, sometimes these are sort of scary stories that might not apply to you. So make sure that you're getting information from reliable sources. Um, again, when you're talking with other people uh, or, or places on social media, don't assume that because of what they're saying, what they're talking about is going to happen for you. And um, you know, really try to look and choose a doctor where you can have a good working relationship and feel that you're part of the team. 
So uh, the next thing that I wanted to mention is Open to Options. And Open to Options is a program that is available at most of the cancer support communities and Gilda's clubs across the nation. And what it is is it is a very structured interview that takes place between a lot of times a licensed mental health professional who has been trained to do this specific type of interview. And it's really helping to gather questions or concerns that you might want to ask to your doctor um, regarding your treatment or surgery or different issues that might be coming up. And so this counselor or this mental health professional is going to help you put into words your questions, your concerns, and they do it in such a way that you are able to get a printout at the end of Open to Options that has all of the questions you want to ask, and we can also email those to your provider or you can bring in a hard copy uh, and it can just really provide a lot of clarity before a next appointment. So next slide, please. Uh, here it's talking about, you know, how can open to options help? It really helps to communicate. It helps you to put together all of those things that are floating around in your head and put them down on paper so you have something you can refer to um, and be able to ask and check off that you got an answer to that. Uh, in, in the whole process, one of the things that the licensed mental health professional or, or open to options counselor will be doing is trying to make sure they're gathering what kinds of treatment options you're open to and if they're going to influence the goals you have. So if you are planning to go to a family wedding or a reunion you always go to, you can ask those questions and get clarity as to whether your treatment will interfere with that. So. Overall, open options can decrease your feelings of distress and anxiety. They're incre it's increasing your confidence to work with your medical team. It enhances your ability to hold productive discussions. And it just overall provides you with a greater sense of satisfaction because you're able to ask those questions and get those answered. So again, we're open to options is available is at your local cancer support communities and Gilda's clubs. And you can find that at www.cancersupportcommunity.org. And also on the cancer support helpline. So the number is 1-888-793-9355. And they can talk with you over the phone and provide uh, open to options appointment with you. The next area that we're going to be discussing is talking about living with uncertainty. And a lot of times a cancer diagnosis, it's so upsetting and can be so overwhelming. And so just knowing that that emotional reaction, that's normal and of course to be expected when you hear something like that. What we're going to be talking about is the differences between uncertainty stress, distress, and then when it's important to reach out for help and perhaps get some outside assistance with that. Because of course we're dealing with really strong emotions and feelings. We're dealing with fear and anger, worry, despair. So I think it's important sometimes uh, people don't quite understand what do you mean living with uncertainty and what is uncertainty. And that refers to the doubt, the suspicion, that lack of sureness about what the future holds. Uh, it can also be about unfamiliarity or the lack of knowledge about an outcome or a result. So it's when you're asking yourself all these different questions with, you know, what happens now? What will treatment be like? How will I feel? Is this going to affect my children and family and work and, you know, uh, additional thoughts like is my cancer going to come back? What if this treatment doesn't work? Am I dying? And on and on and on. 
So you want to ask some questions to yourself. You, you want to try to understand, is this a, a natural temporary adjustment to an extremely upsetting situation? And then you want to say, okay, when is it time that I reach out for professional help? And so some of the questions you can ask is, are you having crying spells that just seem to be coming out of nowhere and, and you're not able to control them? Have you lost interest in life? You're not finding the things that you used to find fun or pleasurable. Have you stopped looking forward to things or events that normally made you happy and now you just you don't care? Additional questions include, you know, are you too tired to participate in those things? Have you lost interest in most things? And then looking at things such as your sleep and your appetite. So are there changes there? Are you having trouble sleeping? Are you sleeping too much? Are you overeating? Have you lost your appetite and don't find yourself eating at all? Are you having a hard time concentrating or making decisions? Um, that is something that a lot of times when you've got something really big on your mind and you're trying to sort through so many different things, that ability to concentrate and make decisions when it feels like there's so many things to be making decisions about. Um, also, what is your mood like? You know, question, am I irritable, grouchy? Am I feeling guilty? Am I feeling helpless? And then are you reaching out to family and friends? If you stop reaching out to your family and friends and you're isolating, uh, that can be concerning. Of course, if you're feeling suicidal, you absolutely, you, you've got to seek help immediately, and that would be calling 911 or going to a local emergency room. But in reference to those questions that I was just mentioning, you know, clinically, if you were to answer yes to four or more of those questions, uh, in particular, if that lasted for one or two weeks or longer, then, then that's an indicator that you might want to seek some type of assistance from your medical health care team or a mental health provider. So at Cancer Support Community, we say, um, you know, so that no one faces cancer alone. And you shouldn't have to either. So if all of these distressing things are going on in your life, we really want you to reach out. When you look at want gaining more control of your life. Um, we don't want you to have any shame in this and that being able to discuss these types of emotional responses is normal and normal for the situation and the healthcare professionals, they're there to help you. So some of the interventions that have been proven to provide relief and this is through research has been support groups, individual couples and family therapy, pharmacological interventions such as antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications, and then other integrative approaches, including things like acupuncture or meditation. Those things have been shown to be helpful. When you're looking to find a counselor or a therapist, you can ask your healthcare team. And these are people who a lot of times will know other mental health professionals who specialize in cancer. So it's important to ask at the source with your healthcare team and find somebody who is perhaps trained in not only life transitions and loss, but you want to have find somebody who's trained in chronic illness and cancer and be able to work with somebody who understands what that experience is like. Um, Psychology Today has a wonderful website. They have a component that's called Therapist Finder and you're able to sort through different filters by putting in your zip code or area and it will pull up therapists uh, in the area and then you can further look through that based on insurance, based on specialties, um, and find the right person for you. A lot of times then you can click on their profile 
and read a little blurb what they've said in regards to how they address counseling and what types of treatment modalities they use in, in therapy. Another good way of finding a counselor is to reach out to perhaps someone from your cancer support group or any of your friends that you trust they may know someone. And then once you've chosen someone, it's important that you meet with them a few times. A cancer support community, we always say try three times. And then if it really doesn't seem like it's a not, a, you know, not a good fit, then of course we want you to find someone that you're going to be able to connect with. Uh, but give it a, a, a good three-time try. Uh, another thing to consider is joining a support group. Support groups are wonderful at helping to reduce those feelings of being alone and being isolated. They can help with that feeling of not being in control and the feelings of hopelessness because you're able to connect with other people who are going through a very similar situation. Um, so and there's both in-person support groups as well as online support groups. A lot of times if you can Google that, you'll, you'll find resources that are available online. And cancer support communities and guilds clubs across the nation have a large number of support groups. They can be cancer specific, they can be general and broad, and they can also have support groups that help support family members. Um, caregivers also need support. So at the local affiliate where I work, we have three different what we call uh, family partner caregiver groups so that they can get support. And I'll just mention as well that there's also children and teen support groups um, if there's younger um, people in your family who are impacted by this diagnosis. So the benefits of support groups, they really help with the depression and anxiety. They help to normalize it to a certain degree because there's people in that group who've been there, done that, and understand it. It also gives that opportunity to talk about some of the things that not everybody else understands, the, the feelings about your body and how it might be changing, the, the way that your intimacy, your connection with others is impacted, and, and how your relationship may be challenged. It's also, I mean, these are, these are your people. These are the people who know what you're going through. Um, we call them the true experts. Um, they're, they're living that and walking that walk. So another benefit of support groups includes sharing of information and education. Your fellow group members have a wealth of information. And I have found in different support groups there's always a couple of different people who are just great researchers and they, they will come in and share information that they have found from reliable sources and they'll share that with the group. And the support groups, they, they help to reduce that isolation and, and help you to feel supported, help, to, help you to feel like there's people around you who really do understand. Of course, um, you know, there, not everybody is up for talking about your fears or your concerns or even if you're wanting to talk about end-of-life issues. But being able to go to a support group where there's people where those things are also on their mind, uh, a support group is a great place to be able to talk about that. And then, of course, there's the positive. There's the upswing. There's that place where you can talk about your good news and, and to be able to share that with these people that you begin beginning to connect and bond with. You can provide encouragement to them as well. And as I mentioned, all of these things are important resources for you. Um, there's several different integrative tools and techniques for managing difficult emotions. And so being able to look at those and see what, what is going to fit for you. So think about exercise and movement. There's lots of yoga and other mind-body practices. 
being able to learn some deep breathing techniques. Um, you know, sometimes they call that belly breathing. Um, being able to take breaks, having some healthy distractions, um, going out into nature and really connecting with nature. Um, there's a technique also called timed worry, and that's just where you focus in on I'm going to take this particular time to worry about it, and then I'm going to let go. And that really helps to manage those emotions as well. It's hard to do, but it is one of those cognitive behavioral type te techniques that when you practice them sometimes, uh, if it's trying one thing, if that doesn't work, try the next one. Um, laughter is another great way to manage emotions. Watching movies or um, watching something on a, a comedy channel, something that gets you laughing. And oftentimes connecting with someone else and talking with someone else, and laughter comes up naturally. Um, using guided meditation or imagery, and there's some great phone apps as well as YouTube. If you go onto YouTube and type in, you know, guided imagery or guided meditation for anxiety or to reduce anxiety, just a whole wealth out there on the internet to do those. And then some of the local cancer support communities also provide. Uh, different classes on meditation and relaxation. Um, when you're looking at managing your, your emotions, being able to connect in with your spirituality or your place of worship, that can be a wonderful place to get support, feel supported and connected. And then being able to express yourself. A lot of times this can be done through artwork, this can be done through journaling. I know here we, we have um, a writing class where people are able to express themselves that way. Um, so there's lots of, of great tools and techniques for managing difficult emotions. So the, the next place we're going to be talking is about nutrition, exercise, and sleep. And I'm going to hand that off to Dr. Shapira, who will be starting it off. Thank you so much. Um, I, I loved your suggestions. I wish we could go through the next section using a little um, self-directed empathy, compassion, and laughter, um, because these are the kinds of things the talk, thinking about nutrition, exercise, and sleep um, brings us to a place where we can start to talk about what each one of you can do to stay well. Um, seeing clinicians, seeing um, social workers, mental health counselors, and being part of a support group um, is absolutely important and, and, and maybe essential, but then the rest of the time, you're on your own and you have to make these decisions about your lifestyle. And one of the decisions we all have to make every day is what we eat. Uh, many of us are also are in a position to be the procurers and providers of food for families. So in many ways, uh, what we eat also sets an example for others, especially kids. There is a lot of research on the connection between nutrition and cancer, but remember that in the setting of metastatic cancer, what we're trying to do is use nutrition to stay well. We're not trying to, do, to use nutrition also as a way of preventing cancer because that, the time has passed. What we're trying to do is to use nutrition to make sure we have all of the right building blocks so our bodies can be um, as strong as they can and so that you can be as healthy as you can, um, because I think that you know it's important to be uh, to to feel to feel as good as you possibly can, and to be as physically active as you possibly can. In a nutshell, um, staying healthy and exercise can really help in so many dimensions of quality of life that it's certainly well worth investing the time and the energy. And also to think about it, you know, choosing what you eat is something that you have complete control over. And that's so important at a time when often um, I've heard from so many patients that they feel they don't have control. 
over so many other important aspects of their life and their health. So there's a lot of information, but there's also a lot of misinformation about uh, the, you know, cancer-fighting diets and so on. So I would like to convey my advice, which is to keep it simple. Uh, You need to know what you enjoy eating. You need to try to season things so that they they are tasteful to you. And most importantly, to look at nutrition and eating, if you are able, as a celebration of life, something to be shared, something to be enjoyed, not something that one has to view as, um, you know, a chore or um, something that feels like a punishment. So to the extent possible, eat as many healthy foods as possible. But if you do enjoy Um, you know, uh, some foods that perhaps are not considered super healthy or if you enjoy um, having an occasional drink, discuss that with your oncologist or your nutritionist and I bet you they'll say that it's fine. There is no one proven anti-cancer diet, but there are plenty of good choices we can all make every day to promote health for ourselves and our families. And let's think about these. Next slide, please. So what is healthy eating? Well, it's eating the right amount and the, and the right proportions of foods and the right categories of foods. Um, most of us can get that just from nature. If we have access to a plant-based diet, um, I happen to love Mediterranean diets because that usually just means ingredients that come you know, from, the, from the sea and from the earth and that are very fresh foods that are, you know, full of color. Usually that means they have a lot of vitamins, um, keeping the amount of animal fat down as much as possible. And uh, that means that you probably don't need to take any supplements. And um, that's something to discuss, again, on a very personal basis. But most of most of you, most of us, don't really need to take supplements. Um, the only one that is usually recommended for many women with metastatic breast cancer are to take additional vitamin D and calcium to preserve the health of bones. It's important to think about preserving a weight, a good weight, and that may mean putting on or losing weight to try to to stay to as uh, lean as, as body weight as possible, but not clearly not losing weight, especially when you are also taking some form of cancer-fighting therapy. Next slide, please. Eating nutritious foods is very important, and it should make you feel good. Uh, Many patients with uh, metastatic breast cancer are also getting chemotherapy, and that may interfere with a sense of taste. So we have to be creative um, and and find perhaps some spices or some some, uh, sauces to restore that taste so that food tastes good as well. And that's something that uh, sometimes is forgotten when we think about the components of diet. Um, A varied diet that is made of different food groups is is important. And again, knowing how much you need and perhaps when over the course of the day you feel more comfortable eating. Not everybody loves to have a big breakfast. um, And we are warned and cautioned against having a big meal before we go to sleep. But for some people, eating in the evening, you know, is also a source of joy. So being flexible and knowing what works for you is important. And just remember to eat with somebody if you can. It's a really, uh, it's a way of celebrating life and something that people can do with each other. Next slide. So think of a plant-based diet if you can. If you're able to eat raw vegetables, that's great. Cooked vegetables are great. They can be roasted, they can be grilled. Um, you know, put them out there and on, the, on your grill if you have access to one and play with, uh, with vegetables. You know, I used to tell my patients to adopt a new vegetable every week, go to the grocery store, find something that looks challenging or interesting, and try to play with it until you find a way of of incorporating it into your diet. Fruits can be great if you're able to eat them again and provide great sources of vitamins, minerals, and fiber, and also phytochemicals. Diets that have whole grains and nuts and legumes are great sources of energy, protein, and fiber. And and speaking about that, make sure that you do have a source of protein if you're on um, a vegetarian or vegan diet. 
Mediterranean diet is sort of the classic example of cardiac health, but it also provides great uh, sources of nutrition for patients living with cancer. Um, Mediterranean diet, typically one that uses olive oil, uses a lot of garlic and cruciferous vegetables, is very tasty, is based on fish, vegetables, and even um, a lot of uh, some dairy products like cheeses that are local. Find fruits and vegetables that you like, and it may it, these may actually provide a health benefit um, and even reduce or influence um, cancer risk. Look for colors, um, and uh, you know we have uh, look for look for orange and yellow in citrus. Look for crunch, which um, which can also make uh, eating interesting, um, and um, you know, try to think about um, expanding your choices by having a very colorful plate in front of you. Next slide, please. So finally, some ideas here about fat content, which is something that many cancer survivors um, often think about, especially women with uh, metastatic breast cancer who often have to take uh, Hormonal therapies that tend to uh, produce weight gain or have to take some steroids, which again increase appetite and lead to weight gain. So think about fat content. There is some data that uh, limiting fat content is very helpful. So think about the kinds of fats that are in the diet and think about the amount of fat that is in the diet. We typically recommend keeping that low if you're if you're able to. Um, and that would be very important. Um, some of the fats are, are healthier than others, so uh, don't be afraid of having some of the diet. They give uh, diet a lot of taste and can be can be can be fine. So just learning about this is important. Next slide, please. Most of us don't need supplements. And um, if you are taking vitamins, my advice is to look at the labels. You don't need anything that offers more than 100% of what you need every day. And remember that you may also be um, consuming that particular nutrient or vitamin in your diet as well. And as I said earlier, calcium may be important, and uh, especially for women who are at risk for, uh, for bone, um, bone loss. Next slide, please. I'm a very um, great fan of, of exercise. I think if you can move, any form of physical activity is better than nothing. Um, our ideal would be 30 minutes of vigorous exercise every day, um, five times a week if you can't do it every day, and if vigorous exercise is beyond your physical ability, then something that works for you. Anything, mild exercise that promotes um, flexibility in the body, some resistance work with some weight. Yoga is a great therapy because, or a great form of exercise because it also has a breathing and mind uh, component that can be very helpful. But whatever it is that you can do, um, I think that this is also it's just as important as all of the other things that we've mentioned. And I think it's very important in preserving muscle mass, preserving bone mass, reducing stress, um, helping you feel good about your body and uh, giving you a sense of control over your body as well. Next slide, please. So finally, um, I think exercise can give you more energy. It certainly can improve your physical ability, improve your balance, lower the risk of falls, broken bones, um, reduce your risk of osteoporosis, and then also some other health concerns. Remember that living with metastatic breast cancer doesn't mean that you stop worrying about everything else. Keep your heart healthy. So exercise can lower the risk of some cardiovascular problems, reduce the risk of blood clots, and it also can help you feel better. And that is uh, translated in a way into sleeping better, perhaps even feeling less stressed, and that may also contribute to make you feel better, less anxious, lowers your risk of depression, and certainly helps you with weight. Next slide. Once you get started, keep it up. Um, have uh, some word perhaps every week 
that allows you to stay focused, um, set realistic goals, reward yourself. That's so nice for all of us. I think we should all do this more often. And perhaps set up some sort of a support or buddy, somebody to remind you. So stay focused, stay positive, um, set your goals, you know, in a realistic range, and then see what you can do. Some people need a little bit of help, and if you have access to a buddy or a coach to get you started, that would be very important as well. Next slide. I'm going to turn it over to Nancy now to walk us through some good tips for sleep health. Thank you. So we're going to look at some sleep disturbances. And what we're talking about is changes in the nighttime sleep that interfere with our ability to function during the daytime. And not surprising, we see this in about 50% of cancer survivors. It can happen with any type of cancer. It can happen to individuals of any age. Um, and when looking at it, it can come up. These sleep disturbances can come up before a diagnosis. But sometimes they worsen during treatment. And, and then a fair amount of time, they can also linger after treatment. And when we look at what increases the, the risk for insomnia and sort of what makes up insomnia, are having trouble falling to sleep, uh, sleep, waking up frequently during the night, uh, perhaps waking up early, early in the morning, and then having trouble going back to sleep. And then sometimes people are feeling not rested even when they've had, quote unquote, a full night's sleep. So some of the reasons cancer survivors have insomnia of course, those can be those pre-existing sleep problems or issues. But with cancer, there can be some treatment-related symptoms that, that is creating this insomnia. Um, certainly nausea, pain, fever, those things are going to keep you up and awake. And then we also see depression and anxiety if there's thoughts and feelings either of worthlessness or that excessive worry about what's going to happen. Those things are going to keep you as awake as well. And then there can be some medications that go along with cancer treatment and what's going on. So it can be some of the corticosteroids or the SSRIs, which are the antidepressants that you could be taking, as well as some blood pressure medications and then other non-sedating antihistamines such as Claritin or Zyrtec. And there are consequences of insomnia. I think for those experiencing it, they certainly feel it. And it's that, that feeling of sleepiness throughout the day and just not really being able to get through the normal routine can be this feeling of just complete exhaustion and fatigue. Uh, it can impact your memory and your ability to recall things. Um, we can certainly see that it increases accidents, um, even just sort of bumping and banging into to things, small little accidents. And of course, there's a concern for much larger ones as well, tripping and falling or difficulties with you know, driving and things like that. Uh, another consequence of insomnia includes that low motivation and mood. And that's going to impact everything else you do. So it can impair social and work activities. And you know, one of the big ones is not sleeping and not getting a full night's sleep can affect your immune system. So it's important that you keep your healthcare team in the loop if you're having difficulty with sleeping. And you can keep track yourself by doing your own type of sleep assessment. Online, if you type in you know, sleep assessment log, you can see some of the things that are important to keep track of. But these would be things about you know, what's your total sleep time in bed? How long is it taking you to go to sleep? How many times are you waking up? And are you napping during the day? How often are you falling asleep during the day, just dozing off without really trying? And how are you rating your quality of sleep overall? It's important to communicate that to your healthcare team. 
uh, along with other symptoms. You want to let them know if you're feeling some anxiety or some depression or just that overall general fatigue. And, and also let them know about what kinds of things you've tried already. So what are some of the things that have worked and, and maybe some of the ones that have not. Sometimes you will be referred for an evaluation for sleep problems. And in this self-report, again, is the key, but further evaluation can depend on how long this has been going on for and how much it's impacting you. So there are sleep disorder centers where they can do some overnight sleep studies, or perhaps there's um, a monitor device they can monitor your sleep as well. Next slide. So there are some things you can do to improve your sleep, and that's usually where doctors like to address, you know, first before jumping right to medication. So some of the things that you can do are implement some cognitive behavioral strategies, engage in some physical activity, and also some stress reduction activities. So when we look at cognitive behavioral strategies, um, some of this is just forming some structure, some sleep restriction in terms of going to bed and getting up at the same time, trying to avoid napping. Also, it might be only going to bed when you're feeling sleepy. And it can include other things such as avoiding caffeine and making sure that your sleep environment is really comfortable. Set it up for a place that this is where you go to sleep. Your bedroom is for sleeping. So not watching television or having your com a computer screen on. Um, there's several studies that show that type of light that comes from your cell phone or your computer screen can affect your, your brain and how you sleep, your sleep patterns. There's cognitive restructuring. Um, so, you know, maybe identifying some of those negative thoughts or anxiety you're experiencing and also engaging in some relaxation techniques before bedtime. So maybe reading, listening to music, taking a warm bath, things like that can be helpful. And as Dr. Shapira mentioned, physical activity is so important. Uh, it's likely to help with sleep. And so being able to incorporate some walking, if it's moderate to intensity walking, that's usually best if you can do that for 30 minutes a few times a week. And also um, some kind of aerobic activity or some stretching can help. Um, getting out every day and getting that bright natural light for 20 minutes in, in the morning if you can go out and garden or go for a little walk or just kind of go through, sit on your porch, um, get that light brought in. Some of the stress reduction techniques include mindfulness-based stress reduction, and I mentioned that earlier. There's different classes on that, as well as yoga and massage. And then those, there are commonly prescribed medications. And if these other things have not worked for you, it may be uh, that you do need some temporary help using a medication. So there's um, things like Ambien and Lunesta. You could also have some type of benzodiazepine like Clonopin or Ativan, Xanax, uh, antihistamines like Benadryl and then melatonin, um, and sometimes those are things too that can be found naturally in some foods as well. Thank you, Nancy. Um, You're before welcome. We, get into, we appreciate it. Um, mm -hmm. Before we get into our question and answer section, uh, the Cancer Support Team did who's listening to know that we have we currently have two booklets and are about to come out with a another book on metastatic breast cancer and they can be um, accessed from our metastatic breast cancer page at www.cancersupportcommunity.org slash metastatic hyphen breast 
hyphen cancer. And this is one more of the booklets that we have available coping with metastatic breast cancer. And then for more information, we wanted to make sure you had other resources. Um, there's our metastatic breast cancer page up as the first one. There's a great uh, clinical trial uh, resource at breastcancertrials.org. Uh, the materials are, are um, all of the studies are written in an easy to understand language to make it easier to search. Um, and then our partners, Living Beyond Breast Cancer and Metastatic Breast Cancer Network are also both uh, trusted resources that you can count on for quality information. So now we would like to open the discussion up to the audience. We may have answered some of your questions during the presentation. However, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to type them into that question and answer box that you see on the right side of your screen. And if you go to the very bottom of that long white box, you'll see a Q&A, and you can click on that and type in a question into the box below. So um, one question that was submitted early um, is, um, what are some of the best ways to counteract fatigue? And Nancy, are you willing to answer that question first, and then we can have Dr. Shapira add on to your answer? Absolutely. So I think, you know, in addressing fatigue, that sometimes it is just the, the body's natural response to what's going on and what you're going through. But you first want to try to address it and see if there's some things that you can do to improve it. So, uh, you know, taking a look at incorporating some regular exercise, and sometimes that sounds counterintuitive to, no, I'm already exhausted, I don't need something that's going to make me exhausted more. Um, but really being able to move and to be able to have that natural movement can help uh, with fatigue. Um, I think being able also to get out, get some sunlight can be helpful. Um, and I know Dr. Shapiro probably has some more medically related information to fatigue as well. So. Uh Piggybacking onto that answer, there definitely are some physical causes for fatigue, sometimes low blood count, sometimes low functioning thyroid. So it's hard to answer the question in a way that applies to everybody, perhaps who's listening. But in general, the first approach to fatigue is to discuss it with the oncologist or the oncology nurse practitioner to make sure that there is nothing that really needs to be addressed and fatigue can be a symptom of an underlying medical problem that could be and needs to be treated. Then fatigue can also be a sign of depression. So it's important to be um, honest really and, and, and make sure that that also um, has been ruled out. People who are depressed even without cancer often find it hard to get out of bed and find it hard to, uh, to push themselves out. But assuming that neither is at play, that, uh, that, that somebody is not really um, physically uh, very ill and is not depressed, then I think that what Nancy mentioned is absolutely spot on. There have been lots and lots of research studies done on cancer-related fatigue. That, that is, and people have defined the cancer-related fatigue as this, you know, very um, difficult, unpleasant symptom that is often not relieved by good sleep. Um, and of all those studies, they've looked at medications, at active stimulants, they've looked at different exercise interventions, a combination of exercise and medications. And to this day, um, the best results are accomplished with exercise. And typically exercise that involves some form of resistance as well, some sort of a, a, a weight uh, training or, or so on. I think 
we are going to learn a lot more over the next decade um, about the physiology of cancer-related fatigue because it's probably different than just being tired. Um, and there may be some very specific uh, things going on in the body um, that relate to the cancer treatment or the cancer itself. Uh, people are finding um, some, uh, some proteins and other mediators in the body that seem to be turned on, almost like an inflammatory state, but slightly different. So um, it's hard to give advice for everybody with fatigue, and I'm just saying this to recognize that I know that there are many uh, people, many women living with metastatic breast cancer, many patients in general, women and men living with cancer who suffer from this for a very long period of time, and it can be very, very distressing. But I would say starting with a very um, sort of uh, methodical approach, making sure that there is nothing uh, physical that needs to be attended to, that there are no nutritional deficits, deficiencies, that there's no real um, mental health um, uh, component to this, and then after that, try, try to do what one can, mostly by very um, natural, almost intuitive things like getting out, being in, in the sunlight and nature if possible, and uh, getting some regular form of exercise. Great, thank you. Um, I think that for a lot of people, um, exercising to reduce fatigue sounds counterintuitive. It sounds like it would have the opposite effect. Um, so it's good that there have been the research studies to show that it actually does um, have the biggest effect of anything that they've tried to study. So thank you. The next question um, I'm going to ask Dr. Shapira to uh, answer first. Um, and this question is, is there anything that you can do as a patient with metastatic breast cancer to live longer without pain? Well, I think that's a, a Great question, and I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to address that again in a personal way. I can try to be um, to give a general answer. I think everybody should try to live without pain or reduce pain to the point where it's very manageable. So living with metastatic breast cancer doesn't necessarily mean that you must live in pain. Um, and for anybody who is living with pain, I would say that having a consultation with a pain specialist, um, asking to see a palliative care specialist is very important because these are the members of the team for whom pain is the primary concern. So they really care about you and your pain. And believe me, managing pain requires uh, a lot of knowledge but also some creativity and resourcefulness because different people experience pain differently. Um, some are very sensitive to it. Others have a way of distracting themselves. And, you know, the same, you look at an x-ray and you think, oh, these two people are hurting and one is hurting a lot and the other may not be. Um, some people um, get by with a very small amount of pharmacologic, meaning medication intervention, and others need more. So I think the important piece about pain is that it can be addressed, hopefully it can be relieved, that there is a lot of individual variation in how this is experienced, and that there's technical expertise on the medical side to deal with it. And again, you know, my advice would be to put it on the table with the team and make sure that you have an opportunity to speak with um, clinicians who really are experts in pain and for whom that is the primary objective of the consultation. And I'll Great. just add in um, very quickly too that, that, that there's a whole component beyond the the, the medical component too of, of the mind-body connection and some of the things that you can introduce to help with the, the pain management. And Dr. Shapira certainly mentioned some of those, but there's some other things out there with uh, with self self hypnosis and meditation practices, 
a lot of people who've utilized sound therapy have found that it has helped with their managing their pain. Um, there's something called EFT for pain relief or tapping. It stands for emotional freedom technique and it's a tapping technique that works on your meridian lines that can help with pain as well as acupuncture and, uh, and target some of that pain as well. Great. Uh, those, are, those are good resources. Thank you. Um, the last question that I have right now, and so I'll encourage anybody who's listening, um, if they have a question that hasn't been answered, to go ahead and type it into that Q&A box. Um, but the last question I have right now is, what is the lifespan of someone with metastatic breast cancer? Dr. Shapira, do you want to start? Sure. Um, the answer to the question is it varies um, depending on when you think the clock starts ticking when you ask that um, question. Is it at the time that metastatic breast cancer was diagnosed? For some patients, perhaps 5% of all um, patients with metastatic breast cancer, actually they're diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer from the get-go. So that's very different than somebody who might have had cancer 15 years earlier and now has metastatic breast cancer. So the natural history is very different. Um, some people live a very short time with this disease, meaning you know a large number of months, and others live many years, more than 10 years. So there's a very, very broad range uh, from, from less than a year to more than a decade. Um, and um, I think that that's sort of the best I can do to give you a, a general answer. Great. And Nancy, uh, do you have anything to add to, to that question? Not really add, it may be circumventing it a little bit, but I think then there's also a quality. And so when you look at the people who are engaging in all the things that we've mentioned earlier today with, with the support groups and getting support, um, addressing exercise, nutrition, and sleep, uh, we may not be able to control the quantity or the length of time, but certainly there is that element and that ability to address that quality of life. Great. Um, and then, Dr. Shapira, I'm going to ask you if you have any last thoughts that you want to leave the listeners of this webinar with. Did we lose you to mute? That happens sometimes. Well, then I'm going to go ahead, Nancy, and ask you if you have any last minute uh, thoughts, the last thoughts that you would like to leave our listeners with. I think I would just put out there that there are so many resources out there and that this is not something that you have to go through alone. There's a lot of materials that address all of the health concerns, the physical concerns, the mind-body concerns, the social and emotional concerns. Um, I think Cancer Support Community has wonderful resources. So I, I think my, my final thoughts would be please engage and, and please take advantage of the resources that are available. Thank you. The Cancer Support Community would like to thank our wonderful panelists, Dr. Lydia Shapira and Nancy Lomibau, for contributing their time and sharing this important information with us. CSC would also like to thank our program supporters, Lily Oncology and Novartis. Please take a moment to complete our webinar evaluation survey, which you will be automatically redirected to. We greatly appreciate any feedback you may have. Thank you for your participation and have a great evening.